Hello, friends, and welcome to the Bikes for Death podcast. As always, my name is Patrick, and I'm your host. And on today's episode, we are going to go way back in time to about two weeks ago when Nickel Potter posted an image on Instagram of a lady who was essentially pressed up against the front window shield of her Dodge Ram pickup that was laying on its side because just moments before she had sped past a group of cyclists in Arkansas and then promptly went on to roll her truck and uh, then Nick Nickel took a picture and it kind of broke the internet. Uh, I definitely shared that image as soon as I saw it. I got a little chuckle out of it. And just like many of y'all did, I'm sure if uh, you're in the bike scene and you're on social media, it was almost impossible to escape that image. Um, now I know we live in a 24 hour news cycle and you know, this is like ancient news at this point. But if you'll remember way back into your brain archives, maybe you'll recall that image, um, which I think should be an NFT. I still have no idea what an NFT is. People are telling me I should get into them. And I don't know anything about that. But I think that if I was going to have an NFT, this is the NFT that I would want. So yeah, I didn't really think too much about it whenever I saw the image other than um, just kind of thinking it was funny and really appreciating the instant karma aspect of the image. But it wasn't until I was on Reddit the next day and I saw it pop up, I don't know, four or five different times on different subreddits. It made the front page of Reddit. And then I, then I saw a link to some news articles and I was like, okay, this is broken out of the bicycling, you know, stratosphere and it has landed outside and it has now become, it's out there kind of in the court of public opinion, so to speak. And it was interesting to go through and read all the Reddit comments from people who are not cyclists. And it really, it really kind of opened my eyes to, uh, just how kind of captivating that image really was. I didn't, I, like I said, I didn't think too much about it whenever I first saw it, but it really is an iconic image, I think. And I don't know if we could call it iconic yet. Maybe it has to stick around a little bit longer, but um, just the look on that lady's face, the scenario, um, it was all kind of just one of those priceless moments almost. That you just couldn't, you almost couldn't write a better screen, you know? And so anyway, I thought it'd be fun to have Nickel come on the podcast to just talk about the image, but I also wanted to hear about the incident in itself and and kind of hear what actually went down. You know, you can read all the comments and 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 uh, and look at pictures on the internet and stuff, but I wanted to I want to hear from the man himself what actually went down, and uh, we had a we had a fun conversation. Some of it was serious, some of it was silly, and the whole thing left me uh, really wanting to just go up and uh, ride bikes with Nickel up in Northwest Arkansas. Maybe we'll get Nickel and Brandon Pack uh, to go on a little bike packing trip up there and do another podcast and actually talk about more bike packing stuff. But every once in a while, it's fun to just do a fun one. So uh, sit back, enjoy this telling of the Dodge Ram truck instant karma lady. And wouldn't it be nice if every single time an aggressive driver expressed their rage using their vehicle as the method of expression, if every time something like that happened, there was some instant karma, uh, that would that would be kind of cool. It'd also be cool if um, we had a justice system and some better laws in place to protect cyclists and penalize those who are in the wrong. And uh, oftentimes, uh, we see that not happening. Uh, what we see often is, is uh, drivers of vehicles um, get off scot-free. That's my experience that I've seen. And so I think that's what really was so captivating about this in image is you just don't see that, you know, that instant karma aspect of it. So all right, well, that's enough about today's episode because we're about to talk all about it. Let's just take a moment to thank the people that made today's episode possible, starting with our newest patrons. First off, we got Daniel Young and Tobias Wessendorf. 
Thank you guys for stepping up to be sustaining members of the Bikes for Death podcast. And if you, dear listener, would like to join them, you can find out more over at patreon.com forward slash bikes or death. And you can sign up for as little as a dollar a month to help support these episodes and every little bit helps. Now, today's episode is also brought to us by Rockgeist. All right, everybody, we got Greg Hardy with Rockgeist here. How you doing, Greg? Good, man. Thanks for having me on. I appreciate it. Man, I had to have you back on because I've been on your website checking out these new 52 hertz welded waterproof frame bags, and they look awesome. But what can you tell me about them? Yeah, man, these have been a long time coming. Uh, they're originally from Scott and his team at Porcelain Rocket. And so it took us probably you know a year and a half to get all the welding equipment set up in our workshop. Um, and then of course, the, the techniques we had to master uh, to get the production up and running. But we're, we're ready. Uh, we're gonna have those out uh, early February. So depending on when you listen to this, we might already be selling them. Sweet. So y'all really make these in Rock Guys headquarters? Yes, and that's uh, one of the unique elements of this bag because it's it's the only uh, welded frame bag that's uh, made in North America. Pretty proud of that, and um, obviously props to the Porcelain Rocket for the design and uh, getting us set up with all this equipment. We're, we're super stoked on the the made in USA and uh, being able to offer that domestically. Now, I noticed that they have roll tops versus zippers. Can you talk to me why that is? Yeah, so these bags are really uh, like expedition proof. So there's no chance of busted zippers and there's no uh, possible way for like water entry through a zipper. So eliminating that um, solves two big problems, water entry and then um, durability from busted zippers. So roll top works every time. Uh, You know what you're gonna get. So it's a, it's a pretty cool design as well. Um, not as cumbersome as one might think. It's kind of easy to get in and out. So I think it does a great job at replacing the zippers. Yeah, no, that makes total sense. I'm actually on your website now and that, uh, that light gray uh, material looks really amazing. But I'm also noticing that y'all have, uh, what, what do you, you offer custom frame bags in this, but you also have universal sizes? Correct, yeah, so these bags are gonna come, the welded bags are gonna come uh, with three main shapes. So we have like a gravel shape, and then sizes within that gravel shape, a mountain shape with a small, medium, large XL. Um, And then we're also doing frame bags that are specifically made for the salsa cutthroat, um, given the popularity of that bike. Yeah, that's cool. So, I mean, there's obviously tons of different frames, sizes, geometries. If somebody's wanting to order one of these universal sizes, you know, what advice do you give to them? Yeah, so check out on the product page, you'll see dimensions called out for each size. And so you can get a pretty good idea of how it's gonna fit in your bike. Um, but also if you're not sure and you're, or you want some help or recommendations, uh, just shoot us an email. And what we, because we have so many templates from our custom work, we can just take your bike and overlay it on the template and uh, shoot you an image of how it's gonna fit before you purchase. So we're happy to do oh, that. Oh, wow. Yeah, it's, it's gonna be really convenient for people. Given all the photo fit and all the custom frame bags we've done over the years, you know, we have like all the popular bikes. Now, if you have like a, a custom frame or like a, some, you know, a, a lesser known model of bike, you know, you might have to send us your photo fit for us to do that. Uh, but I think that's going to be a minority of people. Right on. Well, dude, thank you so much for t- telling us about the new waterproof frame bags. And if people want to learn more, where can they go? Yeah, head to rockguys.com. And if you catch us before February, just put your email in uh, for a sign up on the alerts for when they go on sale. But they're in the welded waterproof section under the frame bags. Right on. Thanks, Greg. Have a great day. All right, Patrick. Take care, man. And today's episode is also brought to us by Quadlock. Quadlock, if you don't know, is the best phone mount for your bicycle they have 
many different kinds that could fashion to your stem, your top tube, your handlebar. Um, they have out front mounts and all kinds of bike mounts. They have a case where it locks right in. I've been using quad lock products for the last 10 years. So I'm really excited to have them as a sponsor of the podcast because um, this is a product I believe in. I use it all the time. And we talk a lot about the applications for bikes, but you know, I also use several of their other products. I also use their desk phone stand. That's also a charging stand. So while I'm Working on putting out podcasts. I got my phone there. It's charging. It's showing me message. I'm multitasking. I'm getting stuff done. And I also have their car mount to take my phone with me while I'm on the road traveling to capture all these wonderful episodes for y'all. And uh, yeah, don't want to be playing on your phone. So you want it up in a good visible place on your windshield, secured and away from your little hands. So um, yeah, listen, Quadlock makes great products. I've dropped my phone countless times. This case is rock solid and uh, I'm not making any guarantees, but I can tell you that in 10 years of use on my personal iPhones, after many crashes and and just dropping my phone like an idiot. I've never cracked a screen. I've never broke a phone, no chips, no dings, no scratches, no nothing. So that's just my own personal uh, quote unquote testimony of this product. So if you want to check out all of their variety of mounts, you can do so over at quadlockcase.com. All right, everybody, bills are paid. And now it is time to get to today's episode Head over to bikesordeath.com and uh, check out the write-up on this one if you want to see some of those subreddits and uh, news articles. I'll, I'll find some of that stuff and uh, link it there over at bikesordeath.com. And without further ado, let's have my friend Miles Arbor take it away with the Bikes or Death theme song. You load up your bike, you ride away from home. You could be with your friends or you could be alone. You ride for a day. Maybe more. You just love being in the great outdoors. Everything you need is strapped to your bars, including that new pillow you got from Santa Claus. And then you think, oh shit to yourself. You let that super lightweight tent on the living room shelf. Bikes. Patrick, hello. How are you doing? I'm good. Nice to uh, meet you digitally. Oh yeah. I uh, I guess I've met. Have I met you in person, or were we just in the same room together? I'm not sure. I saw a bunch of people that night that I hadn't seen in a long time, so I was kind of just bouncing around, saying hi to people, and uh, yeah. I don't think we got to meet. Cool, man. Well, uh, it is nice to meet you. I appreciate you taking the time. What do you uh, What do you do for your day job? I run bike shops. Oh, so what does that have to do with Zoom meetings in the middle of the day? That's that's throwing me off. Well, uh, I run thirteen bike shops, and oh. uh, so today was one of our uh, meetings with uh, a major manufacturer. It's our annual. Uh, kind of financial review and plan for the next year meeting with the big wigs up in uh, Wisconsin. Nice. Well, you might as well plug the bike shop. What uh, what bike shop is this? Yeah, I work at a Fat Tire Bike Shop. Oh, I know Fat Tire. I've been in the one in uh, Bentonville uh, many times. So. Yep. That was our first store in uh, 2007. And then I started with the company in 2010. And, uh, I have since, yeah, we're up to 13 shops now with six in Oklahoma and, uh, seven in Arkansas. And yeah, I've lived in Oklahoma city all summer, getting some new stores open and I have been following you and I it was looking forward to this conversation. Just, uh, I want to pick your brain. It's like, we're both definitely in a small world of people who are crazy about bikes. And I, I, was way more on the riding side and it has transitioned into uh me driving a bike shop van around all the time now yeah 
Well, if you're wondering if I'm in a similar boat, I can tell you that I am. <laughs> My riding has gone way down because I'm I'm currently like I'm a single dad, two daughters, and I have a real estate job where, you know, like today I had to do inspections this morning, then I got to write a contract after this. And, you know, I'm also trying to do the podcast and it's just, you know, it's like, man, finding the time to go ride. It, it all eats into your red time. It does. Now that I know that you're with Fat Tire and work in the bike industry, I, I could ask you like a thousand questions and maybe we can get to some of those. But I would like to kind of kick it off with what's most topical. Uh, but before we do that, is your name Nickel Potter? Yeah. My government name is Nicholas, but my parents always called me Nickel. Okay. Very cool. I wasn't sure if that was an Instagram handle or if that was your real name. So it's, I, uh, yeah, it's on my business card. Cool. Cool. So, uh, to put, I mean, just to start this conversation, you're the guy that took the picture that is everywhere on the internet of, you know, the lady in her crochet or knit sweater, who's like sideways pressed up against her glass of her Dodge Ram on a rural Arkansas road. Like you're the guy that took that picture and posted it on the internet like five days ago. Yes. And, uh, having heard about things going viral, uh, it was a first for me, you know, my Instagram posts usually get like 50 likes Yeah, <laughs> and that one was getting like, I, I don't know. It's, it's definitely slowed down like today, but it's at 6,000 something and 500 yeah. comments. And, uh, so that was something that I had never experienced before is that, uh, kind of attention, but I really think it must've kind of struck a chord with people who ride bikes around crazy people that drive cars. <laughs> oh yeah. I mean, it struck many chords, right? Like the instant karma of it. I mean, we see stuff like this kind of happen where victims to this kind of behavior of drivers, um, but never in the history that I'm aware of, has anyone witnessed the person, you know, crash and I, we're going to have you tell the story, but, um, and then get a picture of them. It's like that instant karma is just like, uh, pretty wild. Yeah, it, it was definitely, it was, you know, and all these things, it all happened so fast, you know, we we're just out on the, well, I was doing the rule of free, um, which Andy Chastain and his wife Jacqueline put on as a free event in Bentonville. And then they lead up to their rule of three, which is uh, the bigger event, but it was awesome. There, you know, a couple hundred people turn out and we were on the 65 mile loop and it wasn't even that far into the ride. I think we were 20, 25 miles in. This was a kind of like an organized ride or was this a race? Uh, well, if there's two people on bikes, it's a race, right? <laughs> it depends. Not when you ride with me. I'm just like, yeah, let's just hang. No, it was just a ride for, for me, for sure. Yeah. And uh, definitely no no timers or anything, yeah. you know. But I mean, yeah, sure, certainly. I mean, if you got that many people, there's going to be people who are, I mean, they want to stretch their legs and they want to kind of go fast and that, you know, for sure. So, but yeah, I guess I'm trying to get an idea of, because because in the Ozarks, um, it, it can be where you're out there for hours on these gravel roads and not see anybody. So I'm kind of wondering if you can also, while you're telling this story, kind of set the stage as to, you know, how many riders were there? You know, did she have to, like, go around a bunch of people? You know, like, what? Yeah, tell us what happened. Yeah, no, that's not, uh, uh, you know, 25 miles into the ride, everybody's pretty spaced out. So I was probably with a group of maybe four or five other people. We had just, the course had just taken a right turn onto, I think it was old wire road where this happened. And so the course had just turned right on the old wire and we'd gone maybe half a mile. And then, you know, somebody yelled car back and you could tell they were coming fast. Not definitely a bit in past going faster, you know, but, but she came around us going probably 35 on a dirt road definitely didn't like slow down to make sure we were all to the right. We were all to the right, you know, as one does when you hear a car back on a dirt road, you just move over. How many cyclists were kind of in your group, you know, at that time you think? Yeah, there's probably four or five of us, maybe six. Okay. So it wasn't like there was 20 cyclists or yeah. The, no. Okay. And we all moved over to the right. I mean, the yeah, road wasn't yeah. that wide there. 
Um, after the fact, I've realized it was a, a lady from Oklahoma City named Stacy and one of her friends from Tulsa. So not people I personally knew, but we were just kind of at the same place at the same time. But yeah, Chuck came around and then in, you know, in classic fashion, gunned it once got around us just to kick up dirt. And it was, you know, it didn't hit us with rocks. Nobody was hurt. Just a big dust cloud. I remember the lady riding next to me pulled up her buff, you know, just to have something to not have to breathe the dust all straight in. So it was a, a significant dusting. But yeah. in the scheme of things. And you felt like it was intentional? Oh, yeah. Well, I mean, it was okay. just, it was somebody just being a jerk. <laughs> I mean, you know, I mean, uh, like not to, you know, I'm, I will be giving only my own opinion today, but yeah, yeah, it was just somebody being a jerk. There's a lot of bad drivers on the road. I mean, there are a lot of people that once they get in their little car bubble, they think that they're invincible and they think that they have all these entitlements and, and I don't know exactly what happens in people's brains, but that, that happens. And, and they, there's another complicating factor here, I think, and this is yeah. again, just a guess um it is new that thousands of riders are heading north out of bentonville to rural missouri gravel roads um and they are and there's tons of rides and a lot of them use some of the same roads and stuff so i do think there's a little bit of just what the hell are you guys trying to take over my roads sentiment i actually yeah. got a uh, facebook message request from a family member of the driver since this has all gone down uh, oh. With the typical you spandex wearing dickheads and <laughs> no way. <laughs> yeah. Oh, well, I guess I shouldn't be surprised. That's kind of what you would expect. <laughs> Maybe I, I replied to just try to like understand what was happening. I, I'll text you the screenshot sometime, but okay. uh, um, it was basically, I got that uh, this person was not even in the car. This was his aunt. And he was just mad and he was like, you know, and this is, all, I guess, because there's like blog posts about it and it's on oh, like yeah. car website now. And it's, it's, it's taken over the internet, man. I mean, I, it, I would, at first I saw it, I mean, I shared it immediately. I, sh I as soon as I saw that picture, I'm like shared, you know, um, but I did, I guess I kind of laughed. I got a chuckle out of it. Um, but it wasn't, in, and I, I started seeing every, I mean, it got shared a ton and I'm not surprised in the bikepacking community and the gravel cycling community that everybody shared it. I mean, it was, it's an epic photo. Um, I mean, that zoomed in shot of granny, like just eating I crow. I, I felt a little bit bad about posting it because it was obviously somebody in a low point yeah uh, pardon the pun but um you know just i i also i do believe in public shaming slightly like you're doing stupid stuff like this is your idiot tax and and uh yeah and yeah so well here's the thing man she put herself in that position right you know you didn't you didn't do anything other then take a picture of a situation that she created herself and then found herself in and Picture is worth a thousand words, man. And that one probably told 10,000 words. And so I think, I think, you know, not to shame her, but to be an example of, yeah, yeah. Well, fuck yeah, dude. We're tired of like our friends getting ran over, hit, killed, and there's no repercussions. I mean, that's, that's the reality. Give so, 10 seconds to save a human life, you know, where it's like, just right. have a little bit of grace. Uh, yeah. Yeah. And that, you know, and I think that is just a real common, persistent kind of issue. And then this kind of captured it all. <laughs> yeah, it did. It was kind of a win for cyclists. And again, if you get over and you're, you're, you know, you're on a legal road and you have the right to be there, there shouldn't be a hostility. And so, yeah, she kind of got what she deserved. I mean, as far as I'm concerned, man. But to, yeah, let, let's hear the story so, so the court of public opinion can weigh in. Sure. So, so yeah, and, and car we, came and, around us and then there was a, a bend in the road. So it went out of sight. 45 seconds later, we came around that bend and trucks on its side. Um, you could clearly see where it all went down. Cause like driver's tire went into the driver's ditch 
overcorrected across the road. And then at that point was like fishtailing back to the, uh, it'd be, you know, the driver's side of the road and then hit that embankment and flipped up on its side. And we like, as we were rolling up, I mean, wheels still turning, you know, it was oh, right yeah. in front of us. And that's why I say that this person had not had to pass a lot of riders leading up to this point because we had just turned onto this road. They were not on that road. They were coming down old wire. So we were the first group they passed. And then I don't know the exact relationship of where there, I think there were two or three riders like a quarter mile ahead of us. And that's the group that this lady lost control at. And so I, I wasn't like right next to the truck, but the uh, the rider who was there said that the somebody yelled something out of the truck at him. I think they gunned it again and lost control. Oh my gosh. Yeah. So the road rage. Yeah. Just, you know, I mean, I, I don't mean to repeat myself, but just acting stupid. I mean, just, yeah. you know, acting a fool, trying to make a point of some sort. Uh, and you have to be going pretty fast to do all that. I mean, to hit, to lose control, fishtail, and then go back up on the embankment and then roll. You have to be carrying enough speed to, to do all that. Right. So the person wasn't not driving safe, not driving safe. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah. Um, and so I think our group collectively, as we saw around the corner that it was that truck and it was on its side, I think we all started laughing immediately. We were like, Oh, it's that truck, you know, cause it was, less than a minute had passed since the dusting. And, um, and as we rolled up, we were a little, you know, everybody's trying to assess what needs to happen right now. So I parked my bike up against a tree and walked over to the truck. Um, I don't have much first aid, but I, I used to lead tours for adventure cycling and I have wilderness first aid. And, you know, there is stuff you can do to help if there's sure. a bad situation. So I came up to the truck and, the lady's in there still yelling. She's going, damn it, damn it, damn it. And, uh, and like, wasn't acknowledging any of us that were around. I kind of looked and I was like, well, I don't really feel like climbing up on the bottom of this hot truck right now. I was kind of looking to see what was happening in the truck. And from my wilderness first aid, um, you're really concerned if you come on somebody and they're not awake, you know, that's like, red flag you've got an injury uh if they're screaming in pain that's good news because they are not unconscious yeah. and if they're just screaming about things that they're mad about they're probably fine right um and i another person in the group was trying to call 911 um and was like dropping a pin to emergency services um and then i also knew there were about 100 riders behind us and so i realized i'm probably not getting into this truck um, if the lady had, you know, if the passengers had shown any sort of like, you know, ask for assistance or, um, you know, I had crossed my mind, we have probably eight people here. We could push it onto its tires or, you know, all those things kind of crossed my mind while standing there in the moment, but just hearing that lady cuss and scream inside the truck and just be so mean, the other lady rider who was with us, she said she didn't feel safe staying because, you know, this person had just been totally reckless and endangering her with their truck. You know, who knows yeah. what they're going to do now that they're even more upset. I, I agree. I mean, that's an elevated situation. I mean, uh, they were already elevated whenever they drove their truck recklessly. And now their their adrenaline is going to be really high. And I've I've I mean, I grew up in Texas, man, and I grew up. Uh, I mean, I remember one time we were at at this you know, we were in high school and this guy wrecked his truck and he got a rifle out of the back of his truck and just started shooting it erratically. And it terrified. I mean, it was a, one of the craziest experiences because he was so out of control. And so I don't, I mean, not to over inflate the situation, but yeah, I mean, you don't know those people and they just tried to pseudo kill y'all. So yeah, yeah, it was totally made sense to me. So that was the moment when I was like, the most important thing I can do right now is take some pictures of this. Yeah. And so I got my cell phone out and I was just, you know, I was just blatantly just taking pictures. Uh, I got some pictures as I rolled up to the truck. Then I stopped and was like seeing if people needed help. 
I realized yeah. I'm not going to benefit anybody here. So th then I took yeah. some pictures up close <laughs> and, uh, and I was like, you know, you seem like you've messed up your day, but you haven't really messed up mine. So I'm out of here. <laughs> oh yeah. Did nobody take a video? I got to thinking about that and, and I don't, I haven't seen any other pictures either. Were you the only one that took a picture? No, there, there are definitely other pictures. There's, there's one really funny one of like, I guess at, it was at some point the lady was off of the front passenger and the guy's just sitting in his truck and he just looks like he's having the worst day. And there's like cyclists all standing around because everybody <laughs> else that came up, they might've had a clue that something funny went on, but there is a video of, um, the lady climbing down on a ladder, like when oh. emergency services are there. Um, Man, that look on her face is just priceless. I'm looking at that picture. And I mean, you can tell, I mean, she doesn't look too concerned. She just looks embarrassed. She yeah. looks like she's kind of made a shit sandwich for herself and now she's got to eat it. Ah, uh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> so that's such a great picture were you that close to take it or is this zoomed in is this a i prop? zoomed in a little bit i probably had walked 15 feet back at that point but yeah. for the for the gram i i had to capture the close-up it was so good man it is so good you need to make this into an nft i have no idea what an nft is i was just talking to a lady before this and she was telling me all about nfts and uh, someone else sent me an email and they want to give me an NFT. And I'm like, I, can you tell me what one is? <laughs> but I bet this would make a great one. Yeah, it's funny. Heck yeah. Seems to have been popular. I'm glad that I was at the right place at the right time. Kind of. Or I mean, what was your feeling about that experience? Were you really upset by it? Or were you able to kind of laugh it off? I mean, how how did you feel in the moment? And how do you feel now? Let's play. Let's, um, let's... I thought it was hilarious at the time, and I still think it's hilarious. Um, <laughs> the the whole like, oh, you could have been killed, and you know, thank God nothing bad happened, is a hundred percent true. You know that 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 you know, if you look at it in that way, like, yes, you just had a crazy person be aggressive with a deadly deadly weapon. Um, but no, I so I come from a touring background. And um, between 2007 and 2008, I did three Trans-American solo. Hmm. Um, and I wasn't raised in the church, so this is a little bit weird, but I know that I have a guardian angel and they have protected me in many occasions. Um, and it, I generally just feel pretty calm about it because they're either going to kill you or they're not. And yeah. usually they miss. So. Well, you know, that that's exactly what my comment was going to be, is that the reality is, as cyclists, we come across um, encounters like this on a fairly regular basis. Sadly, the the odd part here is that there was instant karma and you were able to capture it. But what happened prior to this is is a fairly common occurrence. And so as cyclists, we accept a certain level of you know, we understand that there's a certain level of risk, you know, and, and maybe you could, um, point me in the direction of the guardian angel, angel ship you, you found yourself with. I, I, I didn't, I never knew about it. So I have, I was doing the Southern tier in December and I was in Texas and there was one time that, uh, for no reason I was like, pull over right now. You need to swap your water bottle from your third bottle to your second bottle. I didn't even, I wasn't even out of water, like in the first two bottles, but it was like, stop right now, do this. I pull over and in front of me, there's like this most tremendous noise. Just it sounded like a, a semi truck going over like an old steel bridge, but there wasn't any bridge. I get back on the road to go see what happened and a 18 wheeler on a two lane road, a similar situation had dropped the wheel overcorrected and had, was on both sides of the road with like giant clumps of dirt kicked up onto the road from it being in both ditches and then jackknifed off the road on the oncoming side. Um, so it was like 15 seconds in front of me, insane 18 wheeler on both sides of the road, like <laughs> totally out of control and then crashes. Um, and I was like, whoa, <laughs> yeah. I mean, it was just, it was one of those, like, why did I stop? 
Like what, why, why was I not riding forward there? Like right then when that all happened, man, I've seen some crazy shit like that on, on Reddit. There's a subreddit. I can't remember what it's called. It's like called close calls or something like that. And you'll see, you know, a car flipping through the air and it'll bounce and like bounce right over an old lady who's walking her dog. And you're just like, what the fuck did I just watch? You know? <laughs> yeah. I, I, you know, uh, <laughs> it's hard, you know, it's like one of those things where it's like, I think God was looking out for you. And then the uh, flip side of that, the, the jokesters tell it, you know, or maybe he was trying to kill you. <laughs> yeah, that's a good point. I, uh, I have one experience like that. I wasn't on my bike, but I, uh, swam out in the ocean. I didn't grow up going to the beach at all. So I didn't know about undercurrents and I swam out, I don't know, a hundred yards. I could still see the the beach and where my girlfriend was, she was just like laying on the beach and I wanted to go out to like these big waves and they started to like suck me down and spit me out and suck me down and spit me out. And at first, again, I didn't even know what was happening. Um, but after a while I started realizing that I was going you know, to the ocean, even though I was trying to swim to the shore. Well, long story short, I eventually got tired. And I remember like this wave crashed over me and I was like, well, that's the last thing I'm ever going to see. I'm just, I kind of gave up and I blacked out. And the next thing I know, I'm walking in knee high water up towards the shore. And uh, I go up to my girlfriend and I'm like hyperventilating. I'm throwing up water and just panic attacking. And and I'm like, did you not just see that I almost died? And she's like, no, you just swam up and, you know, walked up here. Like, what's going on? And I'm like, I, I don't know, you know, it was crazy. That's one of the, yeah, I've had, I've had a couple of those experiences where you're just like, huh? <laughs> yeah, I, I have several and they're usually cycling related and uh, I've just accepted it. I'm not, you know, it's like a cool feature. Well, yeah. You, you have to accept it. You have to make your peace in whatever way you make your peace. But as a cyclist, the, these are good conversations to have. And we've had lots of conversations about interaction with cars over the years on the podcast because we're all having those and we all have to, you know, accept some level of, of risk. But well, I was just going to say, you know, uh, <laughs> flipping through some of the 500 strangers comments on my uh, Instagram post, you know, I do have a pretty strong feeling about how cyclists should interact with cars. And I think it is a, it has to be respect in both directions because we are slowing down traffic and we it's, you know, it's like if you're driving a giant Winnebago, like you can't mm -hmm. keep up with the flow of traffic. So you try to let people around you. Yeah. And, and uh, I know that some cyclists behave badly and yeah. I, I encourage people to only see it one way or the other to, you know, not give all cyclists a bad name by getting all cars are terrible because it's a mixed bag in both ways. And we can only just try to make it better. Oh, dude, I could not agree more. I think, I mean, in life, if we stop saying everything is black and white, you know, or saying this person is, you know, this group is completely wrong and I'm completely in the right. Um, or have I'm entitled to this while the Dodge Ram thinks they're entitled. You know, I mean, that's 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 where we lose. And I I think especially when we're talking about riding on roads where we are more often than not the victim, we need to be like be acknowledgeable that I think we need to be very aware, ride defensively. I, sometimes I do think it's appropriate to maybe ride in the middle of a lane for safety if, you know, because I've had, if you give someone like an inch, they'll take it, you know, and so sometimes out of safety, but it's not to be an asshole, you know, it's, I'm preserving my safety. And so, but in general, I, I completely agree. I mean, we can't have a society where, you know, you, you read comments, um, Generally, if you read comments on a cyclist was injured by a vehicle or by a person driving a vehicle, they're going to be anti-cyclists. They're going to be there's going to be people who are applauding and you know saying that that cyclist put themselves in danger and they're an idiot and it's their fault that you know their wife and kids don't have a husband and father anymore. Like they they say deplorable things, and that's not we don't want to be planting our flag the same way that, that they are. That's not the way we're going to make any progress. And, and really, I mean, a larger problem here is infrastructure. I mean, maybe not on the gro remote gravel roads of Arkansas, but damn dude, I've ridden out there so much. Like 
there's, it's not like there's much traffic, you know, I mean, it's not, they're not, you know, we're not talking about uh, a lot of traffic that we're having to deal with out there. So, but I mean, a lot of the infrastructure is so shitty. I mean, cyclists don't want to be on some of these roads, you know, it's like, um, but what else do we have? Yeah. I mean, you know, I, I, uh, I work in the bike industry, so I don't often try to make it a point of how actually dangerous cycling is just because it, do, it doesn't have to be, you know, but the most dangerous right. thing about riding a bike is cars. Yeah. And that's just flat out, you know, people can crash and skin an elbow and, or you get, get a little bit more banged up. I'm glad Andrew's feeling better. Um, yeah. but you know, but th the really bad stuff is usually involves a car and, uh, yeah. you know, and it's usually not the cyclist's fault. So it, it, it's real and it, it does need to be addressed. And, you know, I think there's places like I've gotten to spend a bunch of time in Oklahoma over the last few years. And, you know, Tulsa, they have a really nice riverfront. It's like separated walkers and cyclists. So they even break it down to that point. And when you have a place to ride where you don't have to interact with cars, you can ride safe for, you know, as far as you want. Yeah. And really, Northwest Arkansas is one of the kind of examples of one of the better cycling infrastructures and even, you know, rural remote roads with very little traffic. And, you know, there's things you can do to mitigate uh, risk. And, and Arkansas is actually a pretty good example overall, um, I think, as an, as an outsider looking in. Oh, it, it's it's awesome. It's insane what <laughs> sprinkling tons of money on uh, bicycle infrastructure will do. No, but just, yeah, you know, it, you solve this problem by giving them both space. And, you know, I, I'm, I run big, heavy tires on my bike and I'll ride on the shoulder and I'm happy, happy camper. You know, I, I don't need any more conflict with cars, but yeah. then, yeah, I also run a super bright red blinky and it's on anytime there's a car anywhere near me. I try to be nice to cars, man. I don't want my actions um, as a cyclist to have a negative impact on the community of cyclists as a whole. And I'm like you, when I see, you know, I'm sorry, but, you know, driving around Houston, I, I see quite a bit of roadies and, you know, with their full try and all this stuff. And I mean, I don't know. It just seems to mostly be them uh, that I see a lot of times um, doing that kind of behavior. And it it, it really is... I think it's doing more damage overall because we're going to lose that battle more, more often than not. Right. Like every time. So. Yeah. My, it, uh, it, it, being right. Doesn't, you know, save you from being dead. Right. Yes, exactly. Yes, you are right. But it doesn't mean you should be a dummy and put yourself and, and just more like don't create conflict where there doesn't need to be right. The same way. Don't dust people. Don't, um, what is it called? Coal roll people, you know, when there, there doesn't need to be that, um, a, a very, I, I mean, a, a tragic, but a very similar story. I don't know if this one hit, uh, the cycling community and, and kind of national news, but here in Texas, um, a young 16 year old boy in a, in a Dodge, uh, Ram coal rolled, um, a group of cyclists that were on the shoulder and he lost control and hit and killed six of them. And I mean, it's, it's the exact same scenario. You like, you guys kind of got lucky, you know, but we're, um, yeah, yeah that's such just, a sad story. It's such, it just doesn't need to be, don't create that conflict where there doesn't need to be conflict. Like, why are we being antagonistic to cyclists or why are we, you know, I don't know. It's got, it's not, it's a losing battle either way you look at it. Yeah. You know, and I, uh, I mentioned the message I got on, uh, Facebook from the family member of the driver and in my reply, I said, I'm sorry you had bad experience with cyclists. And I meant, yeah. it, you know, I, I, you know, I don't have any problem with any of these people and I, you know, yeah, you would have helped them if they wanted help, which is what I would have, I would have done the same thing, but, um, they dug themselves a hole and I don't think they wanted y'all to help them out of it. <laughs> well, to your point, you know, I'm sure their adrenaline was through the roof right then. Yeah. And, you know, I, I, uh, I felt very comfortable that they were not in need of medical attention and that they were just stuck in their car. I was going to ask you, so, I mean, some time has passed, it's made the news. Have you actually heard if there was any injuries or any, even were they cited with reckless di driving or, or anything? Have you heard anything about them? 
I have not. I mean, I, I assume that that would have been mentioned in the message from the family member I got, yeah. but it was just, you know, spandex rage. And, uh, and then and everything that I've been able to read about it, I don't even know if they got a ticket. Oh, well, I doubt it. Yeah. It's hard. It's, it's all, he said, she said, or whatever, you know, it's not, unless the cop witnesses it, I don't think there's much to be done. And, you know, and I think in this case, a banged up truck, famous on the internet for stupid reasons. I think our work's done here. <laughs> Wipe our hands of this one. Job well done. Moving on. Yeah. What, what has been the, uh, I mean, first, like, were you surprised by all the likes, the comments, the shares? I mean, it's been in the news. Um, what, what's it been like? Have you got any like backlash or anything other than from the, the one guy? Um, <laughs> well, I woke up on Sunday and it had like 200 likes and I was like a new record, uh, <laughs> for any of my posts. And then I, we were doing inventory in Springdale. And as I was counting the store, I like checked it and it, it was over a thousand. And then it was like 2000 by the time we were done and it was 3000 that night. And I was like, Oh my God, like, what did I do? <laughs> I've never had a post at uh, 5,000. I mean, you're at like 6,000 something. Um, yeah, it's crazy. You know, it's not anything about me. It's the right picture. It's the right time in the right place that spoke to, you know, something in a lot of people. Your comment, your, but your comment was good. That part was you, the instant karma. And, uh, you know, I, I, there, there's a thing going on right now that I do not agree with. And it is when people try to tell you that you're not allowed to describe reality as you see it in front of you. And in this case, um, this unfortunate driver was unable to get out of her vehicle due to her current physical condition. I meant it in a funny way when I said hashtag whale people. Um, I also said hashtag drug people, which is another behavior that is very destructive to people. Nobody had any complaint that I accused them of possibly being on drugs, but I definitely heard from a pretty vocal minority that it was totally inappropriate for me to make any commentary on this person's condition. Um, and that I just, I reject outright. I don't think you get to tell me what I saw. And I do think it's like an attempt to have, it's a power struggle where they want you to not say what you're saying because yeah. some, they, they don't, they don't like it. They think that, yeah. you know, and I, and that, I just, I, I don't want to like get into the weeds there, but I reject that. I described what I saw to you and if you don't like it, that's fine, but I'm not going to like change what I said. Yeah. I mean, I, I agree. I think, um, it's dangerous when we can't say things and describe things and share our opinions and it's a joke. Out. I'm joke. <laughs> yeah. I'm making fun of something that happened in front of me. Yes. Deal with it. Yeah. And that's, I guess we're not allowed to joke around anymore though. I think that's, I think that's part of the I thing. reject that. And <laughs> I, I just don't, I didn't actually, I actually didn't know that part of this story. So I wasn't even digging, uh, that didn't, I, I didn't get, I didn't get any of that. It is a vocal minority. And I like the people I made my Instagram post to thought it was funny, you know, and that, yeah. I don't know. I, I think that, uh, you know, I, I, one of the things that was on there that I want to address is that, uh, the critique that it is not inclusive to cycling by making a comment like that. And my entire life is about getting people on bikes. I've seen so many people come to where I work in an unhealthy condition and they've completely changed their lives and have had, you know, just like watching a butterfly come out of a cocoon or whatever. I mean, just amazing things. And like, and it is a huge part of my business is first time riders. You know, that is a huge focus is getting people their first nice bike. And I, I you know, I, it, I guess I'm admitting that some of it got to me just cause I'm like, you are so wrong. <laughs> I, so you, all you did was say hashtag whale people. It's, it was one of your what hashtags. Yeah. I had like seven hashtags and it was like idiot tax, instant karma, just desserts, drug people, yeah. whale people. I didn't literally think that they were an aquatic creature. 
<laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, I think you're talking about whales here, and I haven't heard a single whale uh, voice an opinion. Man, it's it's unfortunate that people are are so sensitive about everything, and I do think that it is a vocal minority. And I've had this conversation with many friends that I feel like, you know, most people that I know don't have the time to sit around on the Twitter and and worry about these things, you know? Like, whenever... I didn't read all your fucking hashtags. I didn't. I looked at the picture. I was like, ha-ha, instant karma, share, moving on with my life. You know, like, I didn't... It was it was just a haha. That's all it was. I knew that, and um, oh, it's crazy. Yeah, I I I just wanted to address that that I uh, well, I am very much inclusive, fun. and I encourage anyone to go ride their bicycle. Yeah, absolutely. I I mean I I truly believe and preach uh, every single person on bikes. I don't care about anything. I mean I think. I don't even like, uh, you know, talking about groups specifically. I don't think it should be groups. I think it should be everybody, every human, every, you know, every person who wants to. Uh, that should be the person that should be allowed to ride their bike any way they want to ride it and, and, and be able to do it. The best things about cycling is it is like the most individual kind of sport in some sense. You know, it's you and your bike, mm. you know, and you can have you can make it anything you want from there. It's the danger of reading the comments on the internet. Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah, man, it's it's weird. I mean, I get I certainly get my fair share of comments and uh, I try not to care too much. You know, the weird thing is is you can have, you know, so many positive interactions, but it's those those like negative ones that kind of are the loudest for some reason. And actually the uh, I was thinking about this analogy earlier that I um, that I like, but I think what we see a lot is just people who are, are really just focusing on attacking other people. And that's kind of like their thing. And, you know, like I was saying, you know, I, I feel like most people, if they're, they're busy, they're, they're working on improving their lives. And the analogy I always use is that you might've heard me say it, but it takes six months to build a house and six minutes to tear one down and everybody's going around tearing down everybody else's houses when we should be fortifying our own foundation and mowing our lawn and, you know, painting our house and, you know, those things. And if we're, we're involved and we're, uh, you know, uh, pursuing those things, you're not going to have time to like tear everybody else down, you know? And so that's kind of like the perspective I try to keep. And that's what I see a lot is just people wanting to just bring you down, man. You're like, oh, he's getting attention. Great. Now I'm going to find a way to, you know, poke a hole in his house or whatever, throw a rock through his window. Well, Patrick, I think it would be easy to make you a target because you are good at what you do. You, uh, you are interesting. You ask good questions. Um, you know, you're, you're out there doing it. And I think that probably stirs up envy in people, you know, um, I think that what, what you're doing, congratulations on hundred episodes, by the way. Yeah. I just, you know, I think that just, just is the nature of living in a digital world. Yeah. Well, the, one of the best things about it, or one of the positives is, uh, you can take a picture and a lot of people on the internet will see it. I, I don't know if I mentioned this, but like I saw it, um, I mean, once I saw it on, you know, everybody in my cycling group, I wasn't too surprised, but I, I was on uh, Reddit and I saw it on like six or seven different Reddit forms in one, like all on the front page. I mean, it may, do you, are you ever on Reddit? No, I saw one thing and it had 700 comments on one Reddit post. I was like, oh my oh, God. Oh no, man. There's some with way more than that, dude. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you're talking about like tens of thousands or something. I mean, I don't, uh, the yeah the front page of reddit is kind of you know kind of a big deal i guess you know if you hit the front page and i was just scrolling and i saw five uh five or so uh different threads that all had you know thousands and thousands of likes and comments on them and it was all that one picture 
And I, I did, I, I was kind of more interested in reading all the Reddit comments than I was the ones in the cycling community, because I kind of feel like I have a decent, you know, grasp on how we feel about that, but I'm more interested to hear, okay, this, this story gets out to the general public. And, um, I will say that on those comments, I saw a ton of fat shaming, like straight up hardcore inappropriate, you know, I mean, there's, there's funny. And then there's just like, okay, you know, we get it. But, um, I didn't see anyone cussing the cyclist, nobody that I could read. And I read a lot of the comments. Everybody was like, ha ha serves are right. That's what you get. Instant karma. And I didn't, yeah, it was, it was one of the first times I felt like cyclists kind of got, a general, you know, internet population to kind of be like, Hey, hey, look at the cyclists. They won one. That's great. I love it. I'll need to send, I'll send you some of those reddits, man. You'll be, uh, I think you'll be pretty surprised the, the traction it's got. It's pretty crazy. I'll, uh, I'll link them in, you know, like the show notes and stuff. So people can go find them and, and read all. But I mean, that's what, that's actually, when I was on Reddit, I was like, all right, dude, I'm going to, I want to talk about this picture because it broke through the bikepacking gravel community and there's news articles. There's, you know, all these, uh, you know, you said a, a car and driver one or something like that, that are picking it up. So it's, uh, it's getting a lot of attention. Wow. Yeah, no, that's funny. I love it. I mean, I think, yeah, I, w- I would love to uh, think that I had more to do with it. What I had to do with it is I remember that uh, in those weird, quick moments, sometimes the most important thing you can do is get your camera out. And <laughs> I- I'm always the one that uh, takes pictures of my friends when they crash their bikes, like before they get up. <laughs> I'll be like, hey, hey, you know, like, I want to check and see if you're okay. But first, let me get a picture. Because <laughs> you're only muddy on the ground for a second, you know? No, dude. I mean, you told the story. You uh, you checked on her. They didn't want any help, but they were fine. So the only responsible thing to do in a modern day is to take a picture. I mean, the fact that you didn't take a video and put it on TikTok and get you know five billion views, I, you actually like sold yourself short. I mean, that thing could have gone viral. Can you imagine if there was a video of that lady, you know, bitching and cussing y'all out? You know, I mean, you goddamn cyclists, I'm gonna get you when I get out of my Dodge Ram. <laughs> it would have been great. <laughs> I, I I realized that a day later. Yeah. Oh well. Hey, so I was wondering if you knew anything about the stigmatism that surrounds Ram drivers and, and specifically the, well, maybe, yeah, the drivers of Dra- Dodge Ram uh, trucks. Well, I'm a little bit of a car guy. I, uh, yeah. I drive a lot now for work. I like, I personally like old Toyota trucks, uh, so not, not into the Chrysler products. Um, and as a car person... I would never buy a Chrysler. And I think people who, you know, I don't know. I like, I just want them. I, I like it when they work. And that's one of the problems with, it seems to be most Chrysler products. And they just flip over all willy nilly. Every time you pass a cyclist. It's a bunch of decisions that lead you to being an angry Dodge Ram driver. Uh, and I, I think that they just sometimes might tend to line up with the same person that thinks it's a good idea to, roll coal on them or kick up gravel uh or uh or drink and drive yeah maybe and and no i'm not not maybe listen man that's not even a stereotype listen to this so this is a report that came out in december uh 2020 ram 2500 drivers have the most duis more than twice the national average Roughly one in 22 Ram 2500 drivers have been cited with DWIs before. One in 22. That's like, uh, I think the Camaro is the deadliest car for decades. It's just something about you're really likely to die if you think Camaros are freaking awesome. Yeah. I mean, that's not even profiling. That's just, that's just the facts. There's something about, and like I said, I mean, that Texas driver was driving a Dodge Ram and, um, and then we have your Dodge Ram ladies. So I think we put them all in a, a blender and you start to see a picture. It's I, I, it, the evidence is mounting. I don't, I don't think you can argue <laughs> with it. I think it's a scientific fact now. 
So I think the moral of this podcast is if you see a Dodge Ram driver to one, get your camera out, your video out and, uh, and get, you know, get off the road, give them some space. Cause they're, they're gonna, they're gonna put on a, sh- a show or something. <laughs> yeah. Watch out. Here comes trouble. <laughs> Here comes grandma. <laughs> if you saw her in a sh- shopping market, you know, and you went grocery shopping, she was in there. I bet she'd be sweet as pie. But you put her behind a big ass truck like that, and she turns into fucking gr- uh, granny devil. You know, well, where this happened is like 20, 20 miles from my dad's farm. Like I grew up out there. Like I'm, I know these people. Like, you know, they probably are totally normal if you take them out of their car. Yeah, that's that's real. It's a uh, yeah. It's car brain. What were you gonna say? I interrupted you. Um, I was just. I, I, I want to talk to you about other stuff besides this crazy lady. Let's do it. Um, I listened to your interview with Dylan. I used to ride with Dylan back when I could keep up with him. Oh, when was that? 2008? No, okay. Oh, <laughs> uh, right. No, but just, the, yeah, you've talked to Bailey and Andrew and a, a bunch of people that I have tons of respect for and have known for, well, some of them for years and years. And, uh, but no, Dylan, uh, he, uh, yeah, he, he, he broke it down great on your podcast. And I just, I won and just complimenting you on having a good interview. Um, but yeah, it, it stirred up a bunch of memories for me just cause we, uh, yeah, we were riding together a ton back in 20, you know, 13, 14 and, um, and watching that guy go from, working at Ozark National Foods and riding his bike sometimes to being a world-class athlete that somebody I get to still know and talk to has just been an awesome thing to see. And, uh, yeah, I don't know. It was just, it was interesting and it, it was very enjoyable for me. Well, thank you. He, uh, I mean, he and you are both paying me nice compliments, which was essentially, I said on the podcast that, or, well, he said it, which was that whenever I interview his friends, he's like, that's my friend, you know, and, and I, I appreciate that, that I'm able to just, I guess, you know, uh, get people to be themselves, I think is really what it is. And I, I guess that's a talent. I don't, I don't know. I, I think that it might be partly because I'm such a dummy and I'm so like unassuming that I'm just like, <laughs> and people are like, okay, I'll just, you know, kind of cut, cut through the shit and let's just talk, you know, I'm not trying to impress anybody. Well, being relatable and having a, a genuine interest in somebody else uh, is almost unusual. What do you think about uh, Dylan from your perspective as somebody who's got to see him, like you said, I mean, transition over the last like nine years or so? Dylan is very, like most people, is not very braggadocious. Um, you know, most people in this space are not really like, look at me, you know, but he was one of the most uh, recommended or requested people that I, that I interview. I know he has some great accomplishments, but um, it's almost hard to find out even, even what he's done because he's so, it's so kind of quiet. He, he, he's uh he's, he's a sneaky guy. <laughs> no, just cause he doesn't No, he, he, you know, he doesn't talk about himself a lot to others. Um, just, I think it's just part of his, his deal, but no, he, we worked together at the shop and, um, yeah, he's been, he's worked at, at my bike shop on and off a few times. I went and visited him while he was in Colorado. I just happened to be in town and he showed me all around Wheat Ridge, which was fun to see. That's a unique store. He has an impossible ride around the Buffalo that we attempted, I think two or three times and never finished because it was 130 miles out of, out of, uh, Jasper that, it always was, we were dying at 9 PM and cut off the last 30 miles to get back to the truck kind of thing. <laughs> um, but no, just tons of good memories. And, uh, yeah, I, 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 I love seeing that he's been able to, uh, chase that, uh, dream and do so well with it. Yeah. I, I think, uh, by all accounts, um, he's got a bright future, <laughs> Whatever that means. I mean, from talking to him, he just likes to ride his bike. And so well, exactly. it doesn't matter. He's having fun. Yeah. 
if your goal is to go out there and have fun and you're having fun, then you're, you're winning, you know, no matter what. And I thought that was such a great perspective. And it's one that's been reinforced many times on the podcast is, is really like, let's have fun. And, and to kind of take to your point earlier is I, I hope I'm one to champion more of the fun and, and like, let's just focus on all, you know, there's a lot of really good stuff and a lot of great things, a lot of great people and great examples. And I really like to showcase all that. I think there's, I was interviewed recently for, for something else. And I I was like, man, I mean, negativity is just around you everywhere. I mean, it's, it's not hard to find it's shoved down our throat. So I, I try to, you know, let's just, I try to just table. I'll leave that to somebody else. I think it's super important. And, you know, uh, when people talk about the win, and, you know, came in first and, and that is a, you know, if you can get there, that's an amazing place to be. You know, for me personally, I beat the sun at the DK 200 a couple of times. And I was always, you know, super trying to see if I could shave off a few minutes over, you know, last year's time. And, um, I did the DK XL a couple of times and, I was faster the second year and I was super excited about it. And, but now I, I really love riding to goof off and for fun. It, the, in 2019, we did a ride across Arkansas and we did all gravel roads basically from like, Fayette, or we did it from Springdale. Was that with Brandon Pack? Yeah. He invited me on that, man. I couldn't go. I really wanted to. That sucks. It looked like a great time. It was yeah. so fun. That was 2019? I think so. I think it was, it was, or maybe 2020s. Well, it was April, 2019, I think. Yeah, I think so. Man. Yeah. Back in the old world. (laughs) Oh, I know. I watched a video from uh, a big Ben trip that I did. It made a PBS, no, not PBS, uh, Texas parks and wildlife. Um, their, uh, their YouTube, but it was a trip we did to big Ben in 2019 And I was just like, man, the world, it was just a different world. It was only three years ago, but I could feel what I did is I remembered the feeling of being there. And I remembered how everything wasn't as serious almost like every, everybody was just kind of having fun and like the world wasn't crazy. You know, it was, it was, it was a nice feeling, but I kind of forgot that only three years ago we were breathing a little easier and I don't know, there's there's definitely shit going on. <laughs> yeah. No, Brandon Pack is one of my favorite human beings. Uh, he's a great guy. And uh, yeah, we, we had a, uh, an awesome trip. And it was the, kind of the, uh, to me, the perfect example of a party pace ride where we were doing 50, 60 miles a day. We got to camp in time. Everybody was carrying like a real tent and we would like cook food and have yeah. a little whiskey and, you know, sleep a full night sleep and then, you know, get up and make breakfast and then still ride your bike all day. But, uh, um, it's, it's, it's a similar vein to the ultra endurance, you know, fastest known time, just with a little bit more fun, a little bit more chill, you know, uh, I, I think that it's important to have both, uh, in the world and party pace yeah. rides are, are, are the best. I I'm with you. I I don't have the motivation to, uh, to race right now. I think I'll probably get it one day and, you know, um, I, I will kind of want to do my own route, um, and, and see how fast I can do it, which won't be very fast, but it, it doesn't appeal to me right now. You know, what really appeals to me is what exactly what you just, just described is spending a beautiful day on the bike, seeing a lot of stuff, getting to camp early enough to enjoy, you know, part of the day, set up a hammock, you know, when I, I, yeah, I'm with you. I'll drink a little whiskey by the fire and, and sell, tell some stories from the day. That's the way that I enjoy. Cause for me, it's not just the bike ride and it's not just a, a push of endurance. It's for me, I, a big component is the outdoors being outside. A big component for me is taking pictures and, and immersing myself in, in, in the experience and taking the time to, to slow down and take a picture that, yeah, that's, that's to me, that's what really pushes me to go outside. Those are the things that like motivate me, but I love to talk to a Dylan or an Andrew, like the fire and the passion and how, you know, hard they push or Lael or, you know, any number of these people are 
inspirational humans and I love what they do. So I'm with you. We need both. I love both, but yeah, definitely you say party pace. I say pro slow. That that's that other guy that says party pace. I don't know anything about that. (laughs) (laughs) Pro slow. That works. Yeah. We all got to have our little hashtag, you know, I'm just trying to get to 5,000 or 6,000 likes on the internet and I can retire like you. (laughs) <laughs> yeah i'm still waiting for my check i guess it shows up here in a few weeks i don't know man i got almost ten thousand. and no well i don't know people send me weird shit i'm just like i you know you don't even respond but what else did you uh did you have any other topics that you, you said you you wanted to talk about something i'm looking forward to uh your reading of hal's book that sounds like a cool project i spend so much time in cars and i'm also a fan of audiobooks and yeah. um I think that you are going to do well with that. I'm looking forward to oh. hearing it. Oh, man. I appreciate that. Did you listen to the Hal Russell interview, or did you see it online? Or um, I saw your tribute uh, most recently, and I I'm just kind of peripherally know about him. Just I've done the Canadian leg of the Tour Divide twice. I've done the Colorado leg. All, this is all leading tours for adventure cycling, which is very... Uh, it's not even party pace. It's like uh, a retire geriatric pace. Because uh, we do a bunch of cooking and camping and, you know, we do 30, 40 mile days on those kind of trips. Um, but definitely, I don't know. So I've always had this like kind of connection with Banff and just that part of the world. And then the whole, the whole tour divide has always fascinated me, even to the point where two years ago I found a 2008, salsa fargo which is the first year they made it and uh i had on one of my bike tours i was in oregon and i had made a drop bar mountain bike out of a 26 inch wheel specialized hard rock and that's what i took on a four-month bike tour up through yellowstone and canada and and i was almost done and i was in oregon and this bike shop had a drop bar mountain bike it had 29 inch wheels and disc brakes and it blew my mind and it was the coolest thing I had ever seen. And I think at the time I literally had like $50 to my name <laughs> and this bike was like $1,500, you know, it was like, I was like, Whoa. And, uh, so now a full on like decade plus later, I got one. And you're going to ride the tour divide on it. Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> but that was like a ready. purpose built for that race. Yeah. Yeah. No, I mean, that's, yeah, exactly. That was kind of like the original bike for, you know, it's probably the, well, no, 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 at least in this space. Right. I mean, they make track bikes, but I mean, as far as a bike that was built for a particular route, I don't know. That might be the first one ever. Yeah. No, I, I love salsa stuff. I, I, uh, you know, they've always been interested in kind of seeing if they can create a new niche and, uh, dig down on really individual uses. Oh, yeah. yeah, I got one hanging in my garage. I wouldn't turn them down if they called and wanted to give me a sponsorship deal. I'd be like, sure thing. You uh, I, you brought up the Hal Russell book, and I actually have a little bit of an update on that, um, so I might as well share it. I started reading um, the first, so I read the introduction in the first couple chapters so far and sent it over to an editor to start editing and we're playing around with it. Never done an audio book before. So I'm really excited to, to try it. It's actually something that I've been wanting to, to get into for some, I mean, I don't know. I, I just wanted to try it. I listened to a ton of audio books and some people tell me that I have a nice voice and I have all the equipment. So I'm like, this was a perfect opportunity to, um, to, you know, try my hand at it. And, um, I don't know, I actually not to like toot my own horn, but I think it's going to be okay. Like I think with, with, uh, yeah, I think it'll be listenable. (laughs) Yeah, no, I think everything that people have told you is correct. And what are you going to wait on somebody else to do it? Why don't you just do it? That's what I'm saying, man. Yeah, I, yeah, exactly. I was listening. Well, I was reading his book and I was like, man, I wish I could listen to it. Um, cause I listen to almost everything right now. I've been on a uh, giant John Steinbeck kick. Have you ever read much Steinbeck? Yes. Yeah. I just Makes you want to go run off. 
(laughs) (laughs) Well, it depends. Uh, If it travels with Charlie, uh, yeah, yeah. Um, I read uh, Grapes of Wrath and East of Eden recently, or I listened to both of those. I mean, those are both 27-hour books, you know, and so that's like... And and my, I tell tell my buddy this because we uh, we we kind of read together. But my life is conducive to I'm either driving or I'm riding a bike, and so I'm I can't read a book, but I can listen to a ton of them. So yeah, I thought it'd be fun to give it a go. I uh, yeah, I'm in the same boat. I got these uh, the bone conducting headphones, the mm-hmm. aftershocks. The ones that don't go in your ears. It's the best. It's so good. Like you can, you can hear when your chain is dry, you know, you can hear everything around you, but it's like somebody sitting next to you, talking to you. The audio quality like drops off some for like perfect music, but for like speaking voices they're you can't tell a difference. I rarely listen to music. I'm like a podcast audiobook guy. I'm so boring. <laughs> I, I, uh, I'm, I'm right there with you. All right, man. Well, what else we got? Yeah, no, I just, uh, that, that's most of it really. I, uh, I appreciate you reaching out and, uh, it's a funny thing to get to talk about. I don't know. It, it's a little bit weird. My girlfriend was like, uh, what'd she say? She's like, he should interview you about other shit. And I was like, I know, but this is the thing going on. Yeah. Well, what, you know, I figure I'd rather like sit down and talk to you. I'm sure you got a lot more fun things to talk about. And this is, this was kind of a, uh, a fun bikes for death investigative journalism into like cutting edge of social media. Like, I, you know, every once in a while, it's just fun to do like a fun topical. I mean, I don't know. Just, I, I mean, I'm, I'm the guy here. No one else is around. So if like something catches my eye, I'm like, dude, we gotta, you know, talk about that. But uh, but if you want to catch up next time we're in Northwest Arkansas, share a whiskey and, and talk about some bike packing and, and some of that shit. I'm I'm down, man. We'll talk. We can talk about the bike industry, the state of the bike industry. I mean, there's a lot of shit we can talk about, no doubt. Yeah, well, hit me up next time you're up in uh, NWA, and let's uh, hassle Brandon to come up with another fun ride. Okay. Yeah. Let's do. Uh, I'm trying to do more podcasts on trips, you know, like that's been my ultimate vision when I started the podcast from the very beginning. I was actually going to call it Tales from the Trail and only do podcasts on bikepacking trips, but logistically it's very difficult to do, but kind of I'd like to do more and more of those. It's just get in the element, talk about what's actually going on, you know, like be more in the spirit of of what you're doing and what you're talking about. So, I like that idea. Awesome. Well, it's good to meet you, Patrick. And uh, yeah, hit me up whenever you're in town. Will do, man. Thank you, Nickel, for coming on the show. And uh, thank you for taking that picture. And I'm glad you're not dead. Same. (laughs) All right, buddy. Have a good one. Thank you so much for tuning in to today's episode. Uh, I had a lot of fun chatting about this. It is a very serious topic, but um, I think we can also, you know, have fun as we kind of were talking about on this episode. I think we can do both things and I hope we tackled that situation well. And, you know, I do feel bad that we just kind of talked about that, that incident, but, uh, it was, it was interesting to me. It was a, it was a pretty crazy scenario that, like I said, in the episode, I don't, I don't think that's ever happened before to my knowledge. And so, uh, definitely worth talking about, but I will a thousand percent take nickel up on the opportunity to go ride bikes in Northwest Arkansas with him and Brandon and, uh, and we'll do another podcast and talk more bike packing. All right. Well, listen, I already got next week's episode recorded and in the can. I posted this on social media yesterday on my, uh, just on my stories, but Ezra and Ben, um, are currently riding across America. They're doing their own version of the Southern tier. And I found out about them through my friend, Stephanie Hall, who's based in Austin. Um, they were looking for a, a place to stay and, uh, she, they were coming to uh, Bryan college station where I live. And so she 
kind of turned me on to them. And uh, yeah, I did. They did stay in my house. I wasn't here. Uh, I I was it was my birthday weekend and I had plans. And so um, I just uh, what we wound up doing actually is I went to Stephanie's apartment in Austin and all three of us recorded an episode. We talked about their trip, um, how it had been going, some of their backstory. And uh, we also pulled Stephanie into the conversation because her and Ezra are both type one diabetics. And so we talked about riding with type one diabetes and uh, some tips and tricks and things that they've learned along the way. Um, And so it was a great conversation. Those guys are currently, I think on day 22 of what they think will be a 30 day uh, tour across America. And uh, that episode will come out next Wednesday, probably just as they're uh, finishing up their ride. Um, So maybe they'll get to listen to their own podcast as they're uh, as they're pedaling. What else? Listen, we have got a bunch of new exciting products over at the Bikes or Dust store. I feel like we've kind of accidentally become a cup company. We've got titanium cups. We've got ceramic muggles. We've got these little campfire. I don't know what metal. Uh, it's some kind of metal. I don't know what they are. But we have these rattlesnake camp mugs. And I was like, we really need to get in some different stuff. So... We just added yesterday to the web store some hats that I've been testing out for a while. I I originally got this hat from Andrew Onerma, who uh, it's one of his Ozark gravel cyclist hats and just absolutely fell in love with the hat. It's it's a, a floppy hat. It's very lightweight. Um, the probably best thing about it is, well, one, it's comfortable. It looks good. Okay, so those those are really important. But as bike packers, we need to cram things in some places. We have our helmets, so we can't wear our helmet and our uh, hat too, too well. And so the cool thing about this hat is, is it comes with a flat brim, but I like to crease mine. And when you do that, you can literally fold it up and stick it in your pocket. You can stick it in one of your top two bags or your feed bag or, or whatever. It's it's very packable. And, and kind of the nice thing about it is whenever you bring it out of your pack, it looks the same i I don't i don't know what kind of magic they're using to make this hat but you can bend it you can crease it you can crumple it up and it's just gonna look great forever that's not a guarantee uh so yeah pretty excited about those personally because i wear hats all the time i wake up throw on a hat i go to bed i take my hat off and that's about it i think i use one in the shower too um so yeah i'm I'm a hat guy and uh, i really dig this hat hope y'all do too we also got this uh rattlesnake uh design patch available if you just want to get the patch and you can put it on anything you want and uh we just got in some vole straps they're great green with a little tan on there and uh, we're selling those and we also have marked down a lot of items there's a bunch of sale item items on the web store and we're really just trying to get rid of some stuff because we got a lot of stuff and we're trying to make room for some uh, new merchandise with that new logo new logo that we just got um, that honestly pretty stoked about and I'm looking forward to slapping that on just about everything I can find so um, stay tuned for that and in the meantime, yeah, head over to bikesordeath.com, check out the store, and just a couple quick reminders. We offer free shipping in the, in the United States. If you're outside of the United States and you order and it's like some crazy, every once in a while, if you're shipping internationally, it'll charge this crazy amount. And what we do is if it, let's say it charges you $25 and it only costs us 15 we send you a refund for the $10 that you overspent. So it's kind of a messy system, but I don't, I don't know. Sometimes the rates internationally are reasonable and sometimes y'all are getting quoted like crazy high prices and we haven't figured out a good solution for that. So that's on my to-do list. Uh, But until then, that's kind of how we're um, handling that. And one more plug for being a patron. If you sign up, Every single level of patronage gets you a percentage discount. So if you donate a dollar a month to Bikes or Death, you're going to get a code for 5% off your order. 
So, I mean, if you order a hat and you get 5% off, that's a $2 discount, if my math is correct. So you've donated a dollar, but you've saved two, and that's just in your first month. So it's a great way to, you know, support Bikes for Death and uh, get yourself some discounts in the web store. Whew. All right. I think that's enough sales pitch today, don't you? Yeah, I think that's good. It is a beautiful day here in Bryan College Station. I think we're going to be at uh, 65 degrees and not a cloud in the sky. So I'm looking to wrap up this episode, get it out to y'all, and uh, get out on my damn bike and go for a bike ride. So if you're listening to this and you're already on your bike, good for you. And if you're not, get out there and ride your damn bike and watch out for Dodge Rams. It was the middle of the night. You grabbed your knife and you held it tight. The sounds of beasts kept you awake. The sounds they made kept you afraid. In the morning, you packed your bike. Memories forgotten from the previous night. You rode faster than ever before. Was it your imagination or merely folklore? Fear turned into strength as you pushed further. Every pedal stroke, stronger and firmer. Your bike feels weightless, your legs aren't tired. You think to yourself, just a few more miles. Bikes, oh death, bikes, oh death.